in no particular order. Um, we're going to talk about different ways to find delta H in order to, in, in hopes that that's a good way to review um, thermodynamics. So let's just first review what is delta H, right? Delta H is the change in enthalpy. Um, so technically enthalpy is the um, heat change when you're at constant pressure. So if you think of a coffee cup calorimeter, that's going to be constant pressure because it is open to the atmosphere. The lid is not like airtight or anything. So that's going to give you the data to calculate a delta H. Um, do remember that a negative delta H means exothermic and a positive delta H means endo. I feel like you're probably better equipped to recall that now that we've done, you know, reaction profiles and just talked about it a bunch than you were back in September when we first learned this. Okay, so if we're going to make a list of um, ways to find delta H of a reaction, let's go with the first one I said, calorimetry. Remember, calorimetry equation, and this is on your green sheet, Q is equal to MC delta T. Now, Q is heat, okay, with units of joules. Um, it is not delta H, but this is going to be your kind of ticket to getting delta H. So if you want delta H of a reaction, this is an intensive property, so it doesn't matter how much you have, because you're basically going to take the Q of the reaction and divide it by however many moles of the reaction is happening. So here is where like that limiting reactant piece comes in, which was, I think, a little bit harder for you to do back in September, but again, should be a little bit easier for you to do um, now. A lot of times these, these um, questions will actually have perfect stoichiometric ratios, so you can just, you know, figure that out, and then it's pretty easy to get the moles of your reaction. So that's one way to find delta H. Another way to find delta H is with standard heats of formation. Um, so that is going to give you the delta H of a reaction. And what you have to do is add up, that means sum up, all of the standard heats of formation. So notice my little F subscript. And then standard conditions, which is different than STP for gases, but standard conditions are like one atmosphere of pressure, um, usually 25 degrees Celsius, so that's different than STP, and then like one molar for solutions. And this is the sum of all your products. And then you're going to add up the standard heats of formation for all your reactants. And then you can find your delta H of a reaction. Now, remember what standard heats of formation are. Standard heats of formation are the um, energy change when one mole, and this one is set in stone, of a compound, I'm abbreviating compound, is formed from its elements, I'm abbreviating elements, in their standard states. So that means like consider diatomics, um, you know, magnesium, for example, is a solid at room temperature, so you'd have to list it as such. Okay, so we also have Hess's law. That's like the little puzzle, right, where you have to rearrange your different reactions in order to get them to add up to the overall reaction at hand. You can flip reactions, but then you have to switch your sign of delta H. You can multiply through, but then you have to multiply your, your um, value of delta H. Actually, what we talked about up here with standard heats of formation, that's an application of Hess's law. Um, I know we didn't learn it that way, but you can kind of figure that out for yourself. Um, it absolutely is. Then the last way we, we use to find delta H of a reaction is through bond energies. So when you're using bond energies or bond association energies, you need to do your Lewis structures. Now at the start of the year, because we hadn't covered that yet, I drew them for you. Well, that's not going to happen anymore because you need to know what um, the bonding is. And then here to find the, the um, change in enthalpy of the reaction, you're going to sum up all the bond energies of your reactants. This is the only place where you do reactants, which I cannot spell, where you do reactants first minus products. And you might say, huh, why is it different? Well, by definition, bond energies are always positive, okay, because it's the amount of energy it takes in order to break one mole of a certain type of bond. Well, bond breaking 
is always endothermic, okay? But we're really technically only breaking the bonds and the reactants. We're then forming new bonds for the products, but bond energy doesn't like work like that. So when we're doing bond forming, bond formation, that's going to be exothermic. So what this minus sign there does is kind of gives um, the, the products that exothermic um, sign that they need. Because when you're, when you're putting together your products, that's when the bonds are going to be forming and energy would be released. Okay, so these are the four ways that we went over in class on how to find delta, um, what you need to know about thermochemistry. Um, which you, uh, um, now here is a question, a calorimetry question. So I'm not going to go through the whole thing, though you can certainly, you know, do, do the whole thing. Um, but just some key components. So you're given a volume and a molarity of an aqueous solution. So that's some salt in water another volume, another molarity of silver nitrate in water. They are starting at 21.9 degrees Celsius, so that's the T initial, um, and they're mixed in a coffee cup calorimetry, and the temperature increases here. So this is our T final. The fact that the temperature increases means we can say that this is going to be an exothermic reaction, okay? Um, how much heat is produced by this precipitation reaction. So technically, we're just going to use Q is equal to MC delta T in order to figure that out. So um, what assumptions did you make? And then I added on here, how would you find delta H? So let's talk about assumptions. First of all, you're not given any masses. So we're going to have to make an assumption for the mass, okay? And that assumption is going to be that these volumes um, – are mostly of water. It's of an aqueous solution, but it's mostly water. So we can use D is equal to M over V and say that the density of water is one gram per milliliter. And then we can just cross out the, vol the milliliters and put grams, okay? But in our calorimeter, in our cup, we're adding 100 milliliters of each. So that's gonna give us 200, what we're gonna call grams. Another assumption is that we can use the specific heat, which would get, be given to you on the test, it's on your green sheet, um, of water, even though these are solutions. And then we would do our T final minus T initial. I'm not going to throw those numbers in. Okay? Well, maybe I will. Because from this, you can see that this value is going to be positive, right? So your Q value is going to be positive something. I, I, I didn't do the math. Um, well, we said this is an exothermic process. Well, remember what happens. Your reaction is happening, you know, in your calorimeter. It is releasing heat, but it's releasing heat to the surroundings, which happens to be mostly water. It's not the H2O itself that's going through the reaction, right? So the other important thing to, to get here is that the Q lost by, uh, I don't like lost. I don't like lost. The Q given off, released, um, by the reaction is equal to the opposite of the Q absorbed by whatever the surroundings are. And in this case, it's the water, okay? So this value is actually the amount of heat absorbed by the water. So if you take the opposite of that, that'll give you the reaction value. So to find your delta H, you're going to do the Q of the reaction which is gonna equal the opposite of whatever you got, okay? Divided by moles of the reaction. So what are your moles of the reaction? We really should write out the equation N, NaCl plus AgNO3, okay? That's gonna give you sodium nitrate and, mm, sorry, I'll put it down here. Sodium nitrate and um, silver chloride, okay? Here's what I love, one to one to one to one, all right? And if you have 100 milliliters, so that's 0.1 liters of each of these times the molarity, um, so in every one liter there's 0.2 moles, you can very easily figure out how many moles. It ends up being perfect stoichiometric amounts. You just take one of your moles of reactant, and then that's going to go right here, okay? And then you can solve for delta H as well. Helped review. Recall that going to that, I would have to give you um, some thermodynamic data for you to find standard 
heats of formation. So here I just um, highlighted barium carbonate just as an example. Um, and you can look up the delta H sub F for the barium carbonate. If I asked you to write the reaction for the standard heat of formation, you would do BaCO3 solid, okay? And then the elements that are involved, so barium plus carbon plus oxygen, check if any are diatomic, it's oxygen, put their state symbols for what they'd be at one atmosphere of pressure and um, 25 degrees Celsius. So carbon is solid graphite. You don't really need to know the graphite part, but it has different allotropes. And then barium is a solid. And then you'd have to balance this. You cannot change the one here. So you are going to be forced to use fractional coefficients in this case. But that's the equation for standard heat of formation. And then if we wanted to list the delta H, we can read that from the chart as one, negative 1, 12, 19 um, kilojoules per mole of that reaction. Back to this appendix, you can also, you know, if you're provided with this data, you can also look up the values for delta G and for, for S. Okay, so hopefully. So besides enthalpy, delta H, we also talked about entropy, delta S. So bad defi definition of entropy is the amount of disorder in a system. Better definition is the different number of arrangements that you know a molecule can have so different energies or different spatial orientations so the more possibilities the greater the entropy and remember um, second law of thermodynamics entropy of the universe is increasing so a positive delta s is is favorable okay whereas a negative delta h is fa favorable because it means your products are lower in enthalpy than your reactants a positive delta s is favorable um we use Gibbs free energy. So this equation down here is on your um, green sheet. So you all have that. You don't have to memorize it. But we use Gibbs free energy to figure out whether a reaction is thermodynamically favorable, um, aka spontaneous. So that's kind of, that term has fallen out of favor in College Board, but you can still use it. Spontaneous, you just have to meet you just have to remember, does not mean happens fast. What this means, and I'm not going to write all this down, but what this means is that the reaction happens without ongoing outside intervention. Okay, so if a reaction is thermodynamically favorable, it will happen without ongoing outside intervention. Um, and that means that it is, in fact, spontaneous. This doesn't say anything about how fast it happens, right? That's, that's kinetics, the kinetics piece of it. But if you have an exothermic reaction, okay, so that your delta H is negative, and if you have a favorable entropy so that your S term is um, positive, then delta G has to be a negative value, and negative delta G means thermodynamic favor thermodynamically favorable, okay? If you get a positive delta G, that means non-spontaneous, Okay, but the reverse reaction is spontaneous. Um, what sometimes occurs, and, and they love like multiple choice questions like this, they'll ask in order to get a negative delta G, if you have like a positive delta, a, uh, delta H, which is not necessarily favorable, what um, temperature would you need? Find the temperature. That's not a positive sign. That's a T. What temperature in Kelvin would you need if you also have like a positive delta S? Um, and they would give you these values. But um, there's a scenario like this that's always going to give you a negative delta G. Then the opposite scenario will always give you a positive delta G. The scenario where both are either positive or both are negative could give you a negative delta G, and that's usually what we're wanting is a spontaneous reaction. So a lot of times it'll ask you for the temperature in Kelvin. That would flip-flop it, okay? So just set this equal to zero, figure out that temperature, and then read the question carefully so that you know exactly what they would want. Last thing I want to say here is watch your units. S units are going to be in joules times Kelvin over moles, so you're going to have to take joules and turn it into kilojoules because all your other units will be in kilojoules per mole. And you can't subtract unlike terms there. Um, 